this is the panel on independent film production, image and audio. Um, I am your moderator. I'm uh, Dr. Evan Lieberman. I'm the director of the Media Arts and Technology Division here at Cleveland State, and I'm the uh, film production teacher. Um, and I am so thrilled to have such a distinguished panel with us today, such a great group of filmmakers who generously donated their time to uh, talk to us a little bit about their experiences of film production. Uh, we have Michael Barnett uh, from Becoming Bulletproof. Um, look at that. <laughs> that, took me, that took me by surprise, I, I have to say. Um, it's a powerful image. It's a good, yeah. <laughs> and, um, Zev, uh, can we go back to our previous screen? Thank you, Zev DeMeyers from Doodoo's Revenge. Um, wow. Ne uh, can we go to the next? <laughs> Josh Mandel, um, who's on our jury and is a uh, filmmaker behind Uncertain Terms. Um, next screen, we have Mike Ott. I oh, know Karim Senga is not here. I don't know where Mike Ott's. There we go. Um, Mike Ott is here. This is a someone to watch um, sidebar uh, with several films showing in the festival tonight. Pear Blossom Highway and Little Rock are both showing. Um, and finally, we have to my right here Ted Sakura, whose film Move On has shown several times in the festival, in which I was fortunate enough to introduce a really wonderful film. Um, I want to start out by asking uh, about. Um, how your film got from idea into production. We don't want to talk about production quite yet, but that, that often very long stage, maybe in some cases not so long stage, um, between um, the conception of the idea and rolling camera. So, Michael, can you maybe start us off talking about that? Yeah, um, I was sort of in the middle of, uh, of the run of uh, my first film, and, uh, you know, and there's this sort of terrible statistic out there that 95% of filmmakers never make a second movie. And I was uh, determined. I was like, I'm, I'm, I, I need to find a story. I need to find something. I'm not going to be this, this, this statistic. And, uh, and then a couple years had passed, and I was like, uh-oh, man. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to live up to the expectations. And I went to a screening of a film um, in Los Angeles. Uh, and it's this organization called Zeno, and they make these movies um, that are sort of big genre films. You know, they make like horror films and uh, uh, romantic comedies. Um, but everyone who stars in their films has a disability. Um, so the so the the actors in their film, that, you know, um, yeah, have cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, autism. And I went to a screening, and it just floored me. It was sort of everything I wanted in cinema. You know, I laughed and I cried and I was moved and I was profoundly shaken by everything I had just seen. And I ended up at the organization the next day um, asking questions about who they are and what they do. And it took about a year of talking to them just to gain their trust. And then finally, uh, after that, yeah. So it, it was a long process for me um, to get the cameras rolling. And did they um, kind of have a script? Or did you develop the script? With they them? have a script. So my documentary is about the, it's a documentary. It's about the making of their Western film. Their film is called Bulletproof. My film is called Becoming Bulletproof. Yeah, they had a script. They're very good at what they do. They make these sort of large scale production. Um, yeah, and so, and it's this, yeah, lovely organization that has this kind of really radical approach to, uh, you know, kind of like true integration, you know, but, you know, I, I call it like radical inclusion. Um, and they provided the financing? They provide the financing. They've been doing it for a lot of years. The organization's totally free. If you get in, you're in for life, and no one pays to be there, no one gets paid to be there. Uh, and people come back year after year. Some people have been coming for 50 years. Uh, wow. Yeah, it's really an extraordinary thing. And I just, I, I, I sort of had never seen filmmaking made this way before. And we all sort of love the magic of filmmaking. We love watching films about filmmaking. So I thought I could make a film about filmmaking seen through a very, very different lens. That's awesome. Uh, Seth, can you talk to us about how your film came about? Yeah, um, probably a mix of what everyone goes through, a little frustration, disappointment of where you're currently at. Um, I was working in reality TV, 
and I knew this wasn't where I wanted to be. And I, I met a couple different producers that had gone to film school that, you know, everyone has their script they're developing, what they're working on, what they're really going to do, their big plan. And uh, I, I shared, I, I, had, I had written a, a, almost a simple version of the script. Um, not in script form, format or anything like that, but just kind of like a novel form. And uh, I shared it with a friend. Two months go by, and you know, he gives me a call, and he's like, uh, so wow, that was great, that was great. Uh, are you gonna shoot it this weekend? <laughs> and I was like, excuse me? You know, and uh, I just started thinking about it, like I, that simple statement made me feel like I was overcomplicating the process. And so um, I felt like I, I had the know-how, how to be organized and how to get things rolling. So I really just hired myself and um, I put myself to work. I put the script into format, um, started reaching out. I mean, I hired people on Craigslist. I, you know, I really did everything I could by myself. I turned my kitchen into a production office, storyboard, all of that. <laughs> and um, it was almost a can I do this process. So every day it was like, am I really going to do this? Can I really do this? Why can't I? And um, so I think the whole process was really me proving it to myself. And then at the point where you have people waiting on you and hired and you cast it and all this. And so I'm like, all right, I guess it's time to roll camera. And I was totally green going into it. My first film, first panel, first film festival. And uh, sometimes you just have to, you know, as they say, kind of leap and the net will appear. So you had financing in place when, you know, before you were even ready to go. Is that right? No, I mean, <laughs> I financed it myself. I, I worked and, you know, made a little Kickstarter and... Had my mom go around her office like they were Girl Scout cookies, and you know, do you have a dollar so my son can make a movie? And, you know, that's that's what we did, and it worked out. And that's, you know, it, it's an amazing process. That's awesome, Josh. Can you talk about uh, Uncertain Terms? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm the producer of Uncertain Terms. Uh, Nathan Silver is the director, and um, the movie is about a home for pregnant teenage girls, and it's very loosely inspired by his mother's real life situation. His mother was a pregnant teenager at age 16 with his older brother. And um, when he learned the story, you know, kind of what his mom went through because she was sent off to a home for pregnant teenagers. And back then it was very taboo to be pregnant um, at 16. And it really shaped her, you know. She was the only teen, pregnant teen that actually kept her baby out of all the women, the young women that were there. And, um, and so he thought that there was a really good, uh, there was good material there for a story. He wanted to explore it further and also kind of honor his mother, you know, because he loves his mother to death. And so he came up with this idea to sort of, um, you know, make a movie that was very loosely inspired by her story, but set it in a much more idyllic kind of place. Um, she was sent off more to like an institution. Here we filmed in this rural setting in upstate New York. Um, and Nathan's co-writer, Chloe DeMont, she has an obsession with pregnant teenagers for some reason. So when the two of them sort of hooked up, they're like, oh, this sounds like we could really come up with something great here. Cool. Mike, you've been fairly prolific. You've been able to make movies every couple of years. Can you talk about how it is that you've been able to you know, work in the independent realm and produce with the kind of regularity you know, that you've uh, been able to do? Yeah, I mean, I think for the most part, I've just tried to set dates and say, like, I'm going to make something in January of whatever, no matter what, um, and, like, figuring out how, how it's going to happen. Um, I know for, like, Los Angeles, I was, like, getting really depressed because I hadn't made anything, like, in a year, and I was thinking about, I didn't know how I was going to get funding, and my girlfriend at the time and I just said, like, we're going to write something, we're going to shoot it in January, and... We did, and we shot like the first, I think, 15 minutes of Lake LA, and then we came back and did a Kickstarter for the rest of the budget. But um, has crowdfunding uh, been a kind of general technique that you've used in the past? I've, I've only done it once. I only did it for Lake LA, um, and I don't think I ever want to do it again. <laughs> um, there's something. I mean, it's something very nice, but like, you know, people give you money, and I, there's people giving me money who I know have less money than me that are like donating hundred dollars to my film, and I just felt really. It makes it really weird. I understand that. Yeah. And so for, for the, your newest film, can you talk about the uh, process of idea to, you know, to shoot day one? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. The idea, like, we had a, we had like a 10-page outline of kind of what we thought the movie was going to be. And um, 
you know, I just got like a handful of my best friends together and we just went out and started shooting. Um, my casting director did casting for free, like before we had money, and so we just kind of like figured it out. That's great. We were just joined by Karim Sango. Yeah, sorry, um, yes. Of Young Kislowski, who was walking over and I think maybe misjudged the amount of time yeah. he had well, well, I was walking the, 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 the wrong direction for a while. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> this, this happens in Cleveland every yeah. now and again. So can you talk to us just a little bit about um, how Young Kislowski went from idea to, to shooting? Sure, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. I mean, I, I don't think I can really tell, um, do justice to that without saying um, the movie that we made before that. Mm -hmm. Which was um, so. Two of my uh, classmates and I that we, that I met at uh, went to uh, at USC uh, in Los Angeles. We we were in the screenwriting program, but we started making films. Uh, just I mean, just same story over and over again. You know, this all by ourselves without uh, much money. We had a camera and a boom pole, and uh, <laughs> that's that was pretty much it. And we made it. We made an entire feature over weekends and such, and the whole thing was maybe, well, maybe four grand, the whole movie cost. Wow. And, uh, and this would, took us maybe about a year and a half, not every day, but you know, on and off. And, uh, and so the three of us, uh, I had written another script, The Young Kieślowski, and, um, and we were trying to think of uh, what, what, to put, what basket to pull all, put all of our eggs in next. And, um, and it was the same sort of thing, like we just said, look, we're willing to make this mo movie for um, the money that, that, that I had. I worked as a, I was a math tutor and a LSAT tutor. I was a math major in undergrad, so I worked for like five, six years, had maybe forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 saved up, and, uh, and we were just willing to make the movie for that amount. And uh, you know, whatever I could milk out of my parents. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're hearing a theme yeah. here. <laughs> maybe another maybe a couple grand, you know? <laughs> Come on, Mom. <laughs> uh, it's your son. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, and then, you know, exactly, you know what what Mike said. It just you set a start date, and people start to respond to that. Especially if you give it to an actor, you say like, "Hey, look, we need you for these days. We give a three day shoot. You know, here's the script. It so, helps also have a script, like a full <laughs> script. Uh, and so, and then we were able to attract these other people who." Um, ended up investing um it just, just kind of brought it to another level of film that uh, we hadn't expected to make but we're very happy that we got to and so so yeah i think it was just a willing a willingness to make it for less and then whatever happens on the day now looking back like i i don't know if we would have I don't, I don't know if it would have turned out. I don't think we knew what, was, <laughs> we'll what get we were to getting that. into. We'll talk more about that. Yeah. Um, Ted, uh, I know you're, the story of Move On is just a little bit different. Maybe you could talk to us sure. about the genesis of the Move On project. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I make my living here in Cleveland and uh, you know, shooting mostly documentary kind of art films a lot of the time. And uh, Near West Theater had contacted me because they were moving out of their space that they had been for the past 37 years, 38th and Bridge. And, um, you know, I, I went there for this interview. Uh, they were seeing a few other production companies, and it was just as rehearsals were about to start. And I thought, well, if this is going to happen, I'm, I better be ready. Maybe I'll just shoot some stuff today, even, you know. So, brought my camera, and they said, well, you know, what's your concept? And I said, well, Having a little bit of a theater background myself, I said, I really don't think there'll be much of a, a substitute for just being here and kind of experiencing what happens. They didn't have a lot of money. They had a grant from the Gunn Foundation, and I agreed to shoot five days, and then I would um, edit for maybe a couple weeks based on the grants they had. So that first day I did shoot just a little bit, knowing that I wasn't maybe even going to get the gig. Um, and got some really great stuff from the director and realized that he was quite a character, this Bob Navis. And I didn't hear from them again for like two weeks. I figured maybe somebody else got the job. So I, I called them back and I said, well, you know, did you make a decision? And they said, yeah, I think we're going to go with you and we're still trying to find the funding. And I said, well, all right, well, let me get down there and start shooting. And I was so taken by their process. They, they're really, I think, unique within the country and what they do. 
the cast is so diverse. I mean, ages, races, sexual preference. I mean, it's just, I've never been, I've never even imagined there was such a close-knit group that was so diverse. And it, it just inspired me to keep coming and shooting and interviewing. I interviewed, I mean, they had, this was a huge production. They had 65 people in their own, in, in a cast. And then there was like another 30 some in the crew and volunteers. So it was like 100 people to potentially interview. And after like 50 interviews, I wasn't getting redundant material. And some of these people had been in 30, you know, 20 to 30 shows and, and the way they spoke about what this place had meant to them in their lives. You know, I just kept shooting. So here comes day eight, day nine, I'm still shooting. They're like, what are you doing? You're not getting paid for this. And I said, you know, I think there, there might be a bigger story here and let me just see this through. I'm getting a lot out of it, just shooting it. And I don't feel you know, that we're going to have a problem financially if, if we don't decide to do something bigger with it because I love this. So when it was done, I, I, I did my initial sort and then um, ended up feeling like I had 90 minutes of interview bites that were really compelling, 90 minutes of rehearsal that I thought was strong, plus the actual show they did. So they secured a funder to, you know, finance the post-production and you know, the film was turned in about two weeks ago, so, um, I mean, it was submitted in December as a rough cut, and then, then it was just finished right for the fest. Cool. Um, I know the preparation is everything going into the shooting of a film, and what I'd like to talk about just a little bit is the aspects of preparation for a director or producer that you feel are most important before you actually start to uh, roll the cameras. Why don't we start with Seth on that one. Um, what, what, what for you is the most important aspect of, of prep uh, prior to shooting? Um, I would say definitely you have to have your schedule tight. And, and, and I say that because it just shows a general concern and consideration for the people involved. You know, if you're there and you don't know what you're going to get done today or how you're going to get it done or if we're going to shoot this at 3 or at noon or at 1130, it just, it, your project's going to start eroding from the inside. You know, people aren't going to respect what you're doing. You're going to not only look unprofessional, but you're, you're going to feel unprofessional. And it's a waste of time and money. So um, I knew I was going to do a five-day shoot. Um, and I just started really scheduling the scenes in, what I wanted to do by location, and refusing to change it under any circumstance. And um, I think once you commit to something like that, you have to hold yourself accountable and be responsible. So that was something that I felt like I created and had to step up to the challenge. So um, I think your schedule and knowing what you're doing and what you're there to accomplish day by day, not even necessarily the big scheme, but on Monday we're doing this, and on Tuesday we're doing that, I think that's very important to really keep you going and hold yourself accountable for knowing you're getting everything you need. That's great. Michael, it's different for a documentary, isn't it? Yeah, I, so, well, I do, well, so I, I do a lot of narrative as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I sort of approach things the same way. I, I DP all my own stuff. Uh, I own all my own cameras and my own lighting equipment. I've used the same crew for 15 years. So we schedule everything, and then I'm a producer's worst nightmare. I film with <laughs> reckless abandon. Uh, I have a plan, and I throw it away in a heartbeat, and I, and I sort of like let instinct kick in, kick in when I'm there, and I let whatever moment is happening take control of the situation. And I do that in commercials. I do it I, anything I shoot. It's, it's the exact same approach: plan it and then throw it away. So you have a shot list? Do you have a story? I don't really shot list because I don't really have anyone to share it with but myself. <laughs> um, uh, you know, we, we like do a schedule and I sort of, you know, it's, I mean, I've literally have used the same, you know, 55-year-old gaffer for years and the same camera operator. We, we don't even really have to speak anymore. And they understand my kind of like organized chaos method because the result is always the same, which to me is like the best I could possibly get, theoretically, you know. Um, so yeah, uh, it's yeah, it's uh, we do plan it, and we do schedule it, and sometimes I board it, sometimes I don't. Depends on how much time and money and energy we have to put into the project. And, um, but yeah, like doing verite has like informed everything for me. I sort of bring that into every kind of scenario, filming wise now. And would you say being too stuck to a shot list or too stuck 
Yeah, it's not for me. Right. Yeah, it's just not for me. It's not my style. I like to, and I like to do it. And at the end of the day, the shot list is if if we do one, sometimes like clients really want to see it, and we we'll do boards for sort of more advertising or client driven work. But uh, yeah, we'll kind of do it. And at the end of the day, like what we got was nothing like what was up there, <laughs> you know, which kind of drives some people crazy. But in the end, it's a better choice, I think. So. But it, there's no sort of exact way. I mean, I know some people are incredibly rigid in their approach, and it works very, very perfectly for their process. Right. But for mine, it's yeah, that's not at all how I approach things. Mike, um, it seems like there's a good bit of improvisation in your work. Is that right? Yeah. Um, can you talk about prepping for improv? Like how it is that you set the stage so that the actors are comfortable working in that way? Well, I mean, for, for Little Rock, I think we went out, it was just me and the DP and the two actors, and we would just go out and just improv scenes for like a couple months. We'd go out on the weekends and just shoot scenes and try stuff, and then go back and edit it. Um, so we did that for like six months before we actually shot the movie. So you were writing on film, essentially. Kind of, yeah. And so the things that we liked, we would write into the script, and things that didn't work, we would go out. And so we had this kind of opportunity, since it was just the four of us, to kind of experiment, um, which was like a really fun process to do. My thesis film before that, when I made a, my, uh, my first feature, which was like a nightmare because everything was so structured. I had a script, it was like everything was line by line, it was like planned out. Um, and I found that I was just like super bored by that process of, of working. Um, you know, there's this great Robert Altman quote where he says, like, my favorite parts of my films are all the parts I didn't come up with. And I feel like that there's nothing truer, like, when you're making something. Like, when a, so from then on with Little Rock and the rest of the movies, we try to, like, Embrace the chaos, I guess. Embrace the chaos, yeah. I like that. Josh, from a producer standpoint, how do you feel about embracing the chaos? <laughs> I'm one of those rare producers that really embraces the chaos and loves supporting filmmakers to achieve their vision. He um, works with Nathan, so he has to. Yeah, <laughs> I, and I've worked with, with several different filmmakers. I mean, Nathan, he's on one end of the spectrum. I, actually, just like with Mike, you know, where he, he bases his films a lot on, on improvisation, but there's a really negative connotation to improvisation. Most people assume that it means that a director is not prepared mm -hmm. and that they're sort of winging it, and you couldn't be farther from the truth when we're talking about filmmakers like Mike or like Nathan because they prepare, as he just said, you know, for six months sometimes, and in Nathan's case, the same thing, you know, he works with his actors for weeks and sometimes months developing their characters, their backstories, rehearsing, so that by the time everyone walks on set, they are those characters, and that's a lot more preparation than some of the more heavily scripted stuff that I've worked on. Um, I think it just depends on the filmmakers, so I've, I've also worked with filmmakers where they absolutely need that structure, and if they don't have a schedule, and locations locked in, and a script, and just shot list, and all that stuff that I know you said you don't like, then it's a total disaster. So it really just depends on the filmmaker, and I'm totally willing to adapt to the filmmaker and make it the best situation it can be. Tim, I know that you have a kind of a unique approach to how you uh, how you shoot your documentary stuff um, in terms of preparation or in terms of going onto the set and finding finding the moment. Can you talk a little bit about your process? Sure. Um, and, and yeah, having done a narrative feature before, I storyboarded 1,500 images for that one you know, project. I was very structured in that, but like documentary, you, you can't be. And I would echo Mike a lot, I think, on that, that you know, I'm, I'm going many times as the only person. You know, I think for Move On, I, I was probably, I brought a second camera man on for like two of the performance nights, but um, you know, I'm, I started out as an audio engineer. I did that 10 years before I ever picked up a camera. So um, I, I really do try to, uh, you know, just, you've got two channels. I was using a C100, you know, one of them had a mic on the director and then the other one is camera mic. And uh, I would put a really nice boom shotgun on there. So um, if I wanted to grab a quick interview with somebody, I could. Um, I'm, you know, getting to the preparation, I guess, the preparation for me was just having this really flexible gear. You know, I, I basically had two torch LEDs, battery powered on, um, you know, very portable stands so that I could grab a quick interview by just clicking on a couple battery lights in, in the back you know, of, the, of the place. And, um, you know, not knowing what they were going to do from day to day because I was thrown into it so late, I really just had to pick my days and, and spend the whole day, you know, there. So. You know. And how do you find like the right spaces to shoot in, or the right backgrounds, the right kind of 
you know, images that will tell your story when you're kind of on the run in that regard? Well, I, for Move On, it was beautiful because you got the big set, you know, and, and there's, everywhere you turn, there's kind of something interesting, even if it is just the backstage area that, that's, and this place was never meant to be a theater, so it was, uh, it's a really crammed in, tight, very dense, I like to shoot with a deep focus, you know, so that you really do see the fabric of what these people are talking about. Um, you know, there you couldn't miss, and uh, yeah, just finding a great location where you've got a lot of opportunities is, is really key in preparation. Karen, like you're working on a tight budget, and it sounds like you have a pretty thick script that you're working off of. Can you talk about your preparation process and how you make sure that you're able to bring the film to completion sure. uh, on the budget that you're working with? Yeah, I think, uh, well, for, for that first, very first movie, I was talking about uh, we weren't as prepared, um, and for this movie, um, for Young Kieslowski, I think um, I'm probably a lot more on the other side of the spectrum of wanting to have a very, uh, very tight script, and I do re just prepare basically. I, I prepare everything, and uh, what are the elements that you bring in terms of preparation? Well, you know, I have. I mean, number one for me, it's the script. I mean, the script for me, it just has to read like, like. Uh, like a flowing river, you know. I get, like I get, I get a little nervous with uh, um, improvisation, and uh, um, but I love watching movies that are like that, you know. But, um, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so a lot of preparation on the script, and then rehearsing is so important as well. I mean, for the same reasons that were talked about. Like, uh, you know, I've I've heard of movies. I just, you know, actor. Actually, we, in our movie, there was one actor who. I couldn't meet beforehand. He just showed you because of the schedule. And he just showed up, day the first day he had to shoot, and uh, it was a little bumpy. I mean, he was a pro, so it was, he still gave a good performance, but it was just a little bumpy in the beginning. So I just can't imagine not having like two weeks of three, four hours at least a day just uh, uh, rehearsing with that. Just go through from beginning to end every scene, work out the kinks in the dialogue and everything. But then and then. You know, rewrite this, uh, rewrite the little lines here and there. But then, when you get on set, you know, just to know. And then also with the shot list. I mean, I don't, I don't have a storyboard, but I'd like to at least uh, write it down. Like I want these four five shots. And and then when you get there on the day, you have this, you have a, you have a baseline. So at least for me, I like I like to have a baseline where I know like, okay. If, if I'm not inspired today, worst case scenario, this is how this is how good the movie will be. And then if there is something like oh this angle right there, you know, like that sort of lightning strikes, then you then I then go ahead deviate from the from the shot list or grab that thing, and that ends up being some of the best stuff. But um, for me, it's really about rehearsing and going to the locations beforehand. You know, standing there for half the day, finally figuring out where the sun's going to be at X, Y, Z time so that you can get that shot like, oh, the sun peeks out behind the building so that you make sure you're there when that happens. So, um, yeah, if you don't have a lot of money, then I feel like you have to put in that time, whether it be going out with your actors and filming s scenes just to find the script or whatever it is. I mean, you just have to, you have to compensate for that lack of money with preparation in some regard. So. That's good. Um, I just want to remind the panelists, you feel free to interact, right? You can talk to one another. I, I, I don't have to be the only question asker, though I'm okay doing that. Um, you know, used to being a professor and just standing right here and talking for a um, our, our panel is independent film production, sound and image. One of the reasons why sound was included is because we have at uh, CSU right now a sound class going on. So I'd like to talk about that for just a moment. As director, as producer, um, how do you conceptualize the audio portion? Given how important it is, how do you conceptualize the audio portion um, before and then also how do you work with your sound people during and your sound mixer after? So let's kind of talk about the whole spectrum of film sound from your perspective as a filmmaker. Mike, do you want to give that? Do you want to start? Well, I have a good that? nightmare sound story. So maybe nightmare I, sound I, stories know. are good. I, I mean, on my thesis film, I had this, this asshole doing my sound um, <laughs> who 
I was just trusting him that he was recording sound and doing everything. <laughs> just assume that's what he was doing with that boom pole. Um, <laughs> and when we got to post, like it was this long process because we shot on film. I didn't have money to like develop the mo the film, so it was this slow process of getting money, telescening some footage, and then finally I got a hold of him and I said, "Hey, I need all the dats so we can." And when I got the audio back, like he had lost like four dads. So just complete scenes, all the audio gone. There was another day where we were shooting at this video store at night and he was half asleep, I guess. And he was laying next to the thing hitting record, but he wasn't looking. So every time he was hitting record, he was actually hitting stop. So all the audio we had was just in between takes. <laughs> Um, so Sorry it was to like, laugh your misfortune. No, I know, but it, I mean, it was a great learning experience for me because after that, I just realized how important sound is. Because I think as filmmakers, we're always thinking about the image, and you know, a good image with with terrible sound is shit. You right. know, and like it ruins the actors' performances, and um, so it's something I try to really concentrate on now. I'm like actually checking in between takes. Like, hey, let me hear it play back. And do, are you in a situation where you get to actually monitor the sound while they're shooting? Yeah, I have like the headset. But I, I found this this Czech guy who's my now sound. I'm like in love with him because he's like such a professional and he is like a master of sound. So I actually feel like I can trust him. And, um, it's been a nice relationship working with him. Very cool. Michael, do you want to uh, talk about sound and maybe the difference in documentary situations and narrative situations? <laughs> yeah, I think they're the same. Okay. I mean, it's everything, you know. Um, especially in a doc, because you're, you're typically like, docs propel their narrative kind of through audio, you know? I mean, we're, we're typically like taking sound bites, so it is equally as important as picture. Um, and after my first film, I did audio. I've hired audio guys, I've done my own audio. I did audio on my first film, and it sucked. It was <laughs> awful. And because I'm, I'm a DP, and it's like the first thing you disregard, it's the first thing everybody disregards on set. And then you get into post and you're like, why the fuck didn't I put the energy into getting this in the moment? Uh, and so on this film, I hired the best sound mixer in Los Angeles. <laughs> I scraped the money together and, uh, and, I, and I really, really, really learned how important sound is uh, from our last couple of films. And so I had this dream that we were gonna mix this film at the Skywalker Ranch. And it's a little film about disability, and it's about filmmaking. And my producer, who uh, is a wonderful producer, but an, an extreme realist, just sort of kept brushing me aside, being like, yeah, it's a pipe dream, it's never gonna happen. Um, and then our very good friends from uh, 20 Feet From Stardom, we had like the same editors, mm -hmm. and uh, Morgan called them for me early on and kind of set up a meeting. And, um, and they did the film for like almost nothing, for what a, you know, uh, they just watched it and loved it. And we went up there, we, I mean, they must have done a, quarter million dollars worth of work on the film. The first bullet you hear in our film is 17 bullets layered. <laughs> I mean, it was like unbelievable what they did. And we just sat there. And, and when you go up there, before you do anything, they sort of walk you through all the beautiful rooms and where they play it. And they show you it's like a shrine to audio, you know? <laughs> and you learn this, you learn something very important. They, and they hammer this in, into you. They love young filmmakers up there. Um, it's not impossible to get your films in the Skywalker Ranch. They say yes more than they say no, and they work with your budget. And when you go there, they give you this lecture about how if you come up there as early as possible, you will learn that sound is sacrosanct to filming, to cinema, to telling stories. And they want like people to understand that it, not only is it there to just sort of like tell a story, it's there to enhance your story, enhance emotion. And you really learn that from these sort of masters of audio. So I will, if, you know, money, budget, everything willing, I will certainly bring my films back there for the rest of my life. Plus, it's awesome. <laughs> I mean, it's like George Lucas's house. <laughs> That's Best. pretty cool. It's no very cool. No I mean, question it's like, about it. Was like it, a, it was like a nerd film nerd dream. <laughs> <laughs> Ted, you come from an audio background. How do you think that informs your filmmaking and your approach to production? Uh, well, you know, a, a couple of things I just put out there for advice for people starting out. You know, I think a lot of people at this point are willing to, you know, put a few grand into a camera, at least to own some part of your gear. But, you know, a, a good boom mic costs about 2,500 bucks. And it's like, you know, you can get ones that are decent for less than that. But I mean, that's probably like the industry standard, like a Sheps or something. And, 
and there's really a difference, you know, and, and especially if you're going to be doing a lot of run and gunning and, and doing some stuff on your own, that little advantage can, can save your butt, you know, so I, I mean, it was a tough bullet for me to swallow to pick that up, but every time I listen to anything I shoot now, I'm just like, man, I'm so glad I bought that mic. It's in every shot, everything I do, every interview, you know, it's, it's all going through that mic, and potentially, you know, I'll be going through, you know, five cameras over the next 15, 20 years, but that mic could stay with me for that whole time, so. And sound I mean, better. Yeah. yeah. They get nicer, yeah, they get richer. Absolutely, so there's that, but I, I'll, a little story about Move On. Um, when we were, when, when I was hearing these rehearsals in this old wooden build, you know, this room this, that they had as a theater, it just, the performances of this cast was so strong, it was just so beautiful, and the harmonies, you know, and, and when they would actually go to mic everybody up, then it was coming through their PA, and it didn't sound nearly as good, you know, I mean, these little, these lavalier mics and everything, so I reached out to who I feel is the best engineer in town, Chris Keffer, who I've got a long history with. And I said, Chris, I, I just want you to come down here for one of these rehearsals and watch what I'm seeing, and, and I think we need to do something to get this audio right. So, you know, he came down, they did this song. Halfway through it, he like just hits me and goes, wow. You know, and, and I said, all right, it's not just me. He said, no. So we set up a night where the cast would just um, stand on the stage, you know, acoustically, he put up like 12 mics, and we went through all the songs. He, he you know, he mic'd the drum kit and, and all the other instruments, and we've got this beautiful recording that sounds better than you, what you could have heard if you were there because it's not coming through the PA. <laughs> and and it was just uh, the way I ended up shooting the show itself. They did nine performances. I think it was there for like six. You know, I'd set a camera up over here. You know, and I'd shoot the whole show that night. The next night, I'd set one over there, set one in the back. So I, I got all these angles, but it was mostly just me. Um, and everything just drifts ridiculously out of sync with this recording that we did. So, but you can kind of slightly speed things up and, and sync it up. So, so it all worked out. Like, people watch it, and they don't realize that it wasn't like a seven-camera shoot. Um, Aside from the fact that their hairstyles are changing, and, 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 and all that, but uh, I, I, hopefully they're just so wrapped up in the song it doesn't matter. So anyway, but yeah, so audio first. Yeah. Josh, can we talk about it a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in addition to being a producer, I'm also a festival programmer. I program Slam Dance, which is one of the most significant festivals in the U.S. And um, I watch hundreds and hundreds of films every year. I watch about 600 features a year. So I see a lot of the worst that's being made, and I see some of the best that's being made. And one of the biggest problems with films, no matter how good the storytelling is, no matter how good the acting is, is the sound. And filmmakers seem to th treat sound as an afterthought. And I like to think of sound as equally as important to image. Um, I actually think it's good sound is a lot more important than score. Score can often take away from a film, be on the nose, ham-fisted, um, some of the best films out there don't have any score or very minimal score, but great sound design. And I like to think of it like sound design and not just like recording production sound, but that can elevate a film beyond so many others. And um, it's really important to think about the design of the sound for your film as early as possible. And I love to, to bring in a sound designer early on, and even if they're not there on set, just to have discussions with the director about what they're kind of going for, because you can save so much money in production if you know what you're going to do in post-production, whether it's music, whether it's certain scenes that you can film differently because you can lay in audio later. And you shouldn't treat post-audio as like, oh, we're just going to fix everything at the end <laughs> because that's going to cost you more money. You should look at it, no, we're just going to fine tune and polish and add to the picture at the end. So. Very good. Sam, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I definitely knew the importance of sound, and I was willing to spend money on sound. Um, all the people that I knew that were in, um, that were engineers or worked in sound or whatever, it, you know, it's constantly the my band didn't work out, so I ended up doing audio somehow. Right. And uh, <laughs> and I was, I mean, I didn't mind that at all. But at the same time, I, you know, I knew that this was my first project. And I just wanted the level of seriousness about it, not like, hey, I'll hang out and press record. And um, I trust no one, so what I did is we, uh, we shot, and every night I made him dump 
the the cards. Mm -hmm. I took the cards home. And I would just kind of go through three, go go through it a little bit. At least just watch the levels and look for cracks or anything like that. Um, and then when I was done with the film, I I had worked in not worked in music, but I I thought I was going to do music too. So I knew the power of sound design, and there was a lot of parts that I knew I was going to have to insert. So I was kind of prepared. We did some our own. I mean, I made a couple sounds, but um, I mean it's crucially important. I, I, it, it, same thing. You see a movie and the sound is bad. Right. It's like saying, you know, I really don't care what you hear, and that's like it's fifty-fifty. It's, 50 -50. You're it's like a really willing to forgive the bad. If you if you have if you don't have a lot of money, if you're using if you're shooting black like bad lighting or whatever, you, I would always forgive that sooner yeah. than hearing like. Oh, yeah, and, and, and you can you can have a bad shot and maybe convince someone that you're artsy. Like, oh no, it's supposed to be like that. No. Yeah. Out of focus is how I wanted it. You know? But uh, convincing someone you wanted them to mumble or for them to sound like that, that's, that's a hard that's a hard one to sell. I have a, a sort of a great caution, well, a sad cautionary tale when it comes to audio. Uh, a very dear friend of mine who uh, was a pretty well-known comedian out of Los Angeles, sort of got fed up and he moved back to Boston. And he um, did a Kickstarter campaign a couple years ago for a very small film. Um, and it worked, and he was an honest guy, and a great writer, and a brilliant mind, and he wrote a wonderful film, and he made it for $5,000, and it got into Toronto. Wow. And it was a dream come true. Uh, and he didn't have an audio guy. He used a camera mic on a 5D. Um, I saw the film, and it blew me away. It's so good, and so funny, and so sad, and um, it went there, and it got read by UTA at Toronto, and they were like, we want to sell it, Where's the good audio? Did you not have time to mix it? And he's like, that's it, man. That's two years ago, and no one has touched the movie, and everyone who sees it is like, it is brilliant. The audio sucks. We cannot, it will never pass QC at any broadcaster or any distributor, and it's dead because of the audio. That's, that is a cautionary tale. And on a brighter note, when we went to <laughs> the Lucas Ranch, I sent our film there, and I was like, yeah, you know, if you guys have some ideas, a 37-page document of <laughs> audio ideas came back to us of how to enhance every scene through audio. It's awesome. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> no doubt. Um, Karen, did, uh, when you set out to make a film, do you have a kind of a sense of what you want it to sound like as well as what you oh, want yeah. it to look like? I Can mean, you talk about that maybe? Like this bit? room sounds like something, you know? I mean, the. the when I think of like the master directors, like Terrence Malick, for example, mm -hmm. like if you watch the, I don't know what I can add to this except maybe go see some of these movies, <laughs> like Thin Red Line, yeah. like you just there's very little score in Thin Red Line, um, and it's, and it feels you know, I mean, there's a million war movies out there, but and this movie for some reason feels like more like you are, on that hill somehow. And uh, and the sound in that movie, you can just like hear the rustling of the, the, you know, the tall grass kind of moving through. I mean, you just hear every little thing in that movie, and I think that's one of the things that really elevates it. Um, another movie that comes to mind is uh, Amour. I think this in this movie like basically takes place mostly in this apartment. Most of the movie it takes place in the apartment, but he's just uh, it's just. Like you just really get like you just hear the they just put the microphones in the right place, you know. And I, I think when you when you think of uh, just really good scenes or really really absorbing uh, movies um, scenes, like a lot of it has to do with how what I mean the sound is everywhere in the movie and the, the, the what you're looking at is just right here, but the sound is like completely surrounding you. So uh, uh, also room tone. Get room tone. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Everyone seems to agree with get yeah. room tone. <laughs> or like a Ken Burns, like a, you know, you just have the, the documents just have a picture, right? And they're just kind of moving on the picture. Like, what are you doing with the picture? But it feels, I mean, if you put the right, like, like that bait, like, I don't know if you've seen this baseball document. I watched every hour of that thing. Yeah. And uh, it's like the first 50 years of baseball, all you have is these, these cracked black and white pictures that look like junk, but it still feels like, and there's all this posted audio afterwards, like you hear the crowd, I mean, it just feels like you're, you're really there you know, in a way that uh, even more so than uh, with image.
Cool. I want to ask one more question and then open it up for some audience questions because I want to get to that before we lose Josh. We, right, we lose you in uh, about 15 minutes. So um, I want to at least, if anybody has any questions for you, give you the opportunity to do that. But what I'd like to ask um, at this point is, um, filmmaking is a series of challenges, always, right? Uh, it challenges in pre-production. But what I'm interested in um, talking about a little bit is, for you, what are the biggest challenges on set? in terms of keeping the momentum going, in terms of getting what you want, in terms of getting the most out of your crew and out of your cast. So if you could talk a little bit about your challenges on set and how you, you know, what strategies you use to kind of deal with those challenges. And maybe we could start with Josh as a producer. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I've, I've been on so many sets from films to TV to commercials, music videos. Um, you never know what the final product is going to be when you're on set because you know you're you're like working hard you're everyone's doing their job and people are so focused on their job whether it's wardrobe or hair or sound or whatever that they don't look at the bigger picture and that's it's a good thing in terms of keeping things efficient it's a bad thing in terms of bringing everyone together and and seeing this like unified vision so what I try and do is is get everyone to sort of be on the same page, and it all comes back to the filmmaker. You know, do they do they believe in the filmmaker? Do they believe in what they're actually working on? Because the last thing you want is people just working on a on a set because they're getting a paycheck, and it's just something to do rather than like really believing that this is going to be something special. What would you say are some factors are for a filmmaker in terms of getting that support from the crew? Well, sometimes, I mean, when you have a filmmaker that's done other work before, that's like a huge bonus because then you can show that work to these people and they're like, oh wow, that was great. Like, even if it's a short, you know, like a short to a short or a short to a first feature, it just gives people like some sort of reason to believe that they're actually working on something good because no matter what anyone says about, oh, I just need the paycheck, whatever, like, no one likes working on something that they know is bad. No one does, you know, no matter how much money it is. So um, if, you can, if you can give people the assurance that, they're, that, they're, that what they're doing, whether it's for 50 bucks a day or no money a day or, you know, 200 bucks a day, whatever, that it's actually going towards something that they're going to be proud of, it doesn't matter if it's a huge commercial success because at the end of the day, they're going to be really proud of the finished product. That's I, would, I would also say, like, I think when you're making a movie for no money and you're having people, like, donate their time, I mean, one thing I tried to do early on was, like, make people feel like they're adding a creative voice to what you're doing, opposed to, like, just doing a job. So whether that's, like, at the end of each take, saying to the actor, like, what do you want to do? Do whatever you want on this take. Like, go for it. Like, add whatever you mm -hmm. want. And it might be stuff you end up using, or having the DP come up with whatever shot he wants to do, like, add into the shot list. Um, I think having that kind of thing makes people feel connected to the material and actually have it, they're invested in it opposed to just showing up and being a worker. So yeah. giving them a sense of ownership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael, you have anything to... Yeah. Um, well, wait, what's the question? We're talking, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking about challenges on set and oh, we've so kind right. of migrated towards confidence in the director. Yes. As being a very yeah, I mean, really, that's everything, element. right? I mean, you gotta like, I mean, you really are taking your troops into battle. Um, and, and while you're doing that, you're doing that with moments of like, paralysis of self-doubt and then moments of grandeur and then like swallowing narcissism and then, you know it's like it's a it's a bizarre job and it's a really complicated job that seems fairly easy from the outside like hey you sit there and you say action and eh, but it's it's your everything you know what I mean it's like down to the core of my DNA I want to make good shit you right. know so and I'm obsessed with it and I lose sleep over it and I you know it, 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 it's a job for weird people, and uh, you know, and I like being around weird filmmakers, and I want to live that life forever, and I want to make great stuff, you know. Now so I, I know you're your own DP, mm -hmm. but how do you communicate kind of that idea to the rest of the crew? Yeah, man, I talk a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm sort of always talking because uh, I don't really have two gears. I don't go into kind of lighting gear when I'm rehearsing. My actors learn very quickly that I'll like look and see like light and I'll sort of talk about it and then I'll refocus back on them. But I'll be like, keep going, keep going. And then I'm like, I'm still listening. So, you know, and I am, sort of, depends, you know. <laughs> so but it's, it's like, I like that method. It works really well for me because my day gets consumed by the work instead of like down, I don't have any downtime on set and I hate downtime on set. 
I want to shoot and I want to shoot right fucking now. You know, like right. that's it. So in a sense, it's your own dedication yes. to the process yeah. that brings people, you know, into it. Yes, absolutely. So, do you real quick aside. Okay, sorry. Real quick aside. Uh, any first time filmmakers, if you're ever making a film, go to Slam Dance, bring it there. That festival yes. is amazing. We took our first film there and it was like a dream. It was unbelievable. I, I will agree with that, that Slam Dance is one of the great festivals yeah. and an antidote in some ways to Sundance, if I may say. Um, you really feel like you're among filmmakers there. It's really, it's wonderful. I'm sorry, Seb? Um, yeah, uh, I think I'm a bit of a psychopath. You sound like one on set. I'm probably the same way. Um, <laughs> You know, because you, you want to make good shit, as you say, and you're serious about it, and I have high expectations of myself, and I have high expectations of the people that are there, and uh, I let them know that, and I communicate with everybody, and it's not always in the nicest way, so in order to counterbalance that, the crafty is awesome. Yes. yes. Good crafty, you know, little things like that, but um, I, was, I was just as much a director as I was my own PA. You know, I kept, and I think when people see that you're willing to do everything, you're willing to park someone's car, you want to do anything and everything, that kind of um, work ethic is contagious. And, um, you know, originally I thought that directors were, you know, people who sat here behind the monitor. And, <laughs> you know, you know, but it's not that. And um, I think when people see that you want to create something great, it, it's just contagious. And you know, um, making sure everyone knows what's going on. I'm absolutely a no surprises guy. So as much as I do, um, it's fun to be spontaneous. I'm not prepared for the surprises. So I, at the same time, try to communicate with people so everyone knows where we're at and where we're going and everything like that. And just be fair and, you know, keep the crafty stock. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Cameron? Uh, well, I guess uh, I've also lost sight of the question. Well, the original question was about the challenges that you face as a filmmaker on set oh, right. in terms of getting what you want, and well, we've kind of migrated towards communication with the crew and creating a sense of confidence. You know, it's something that, uh, as I went along, so we had a script supervisor, um, and uh, I was surprised by what she said. She was like, maybe two two weeks in. She was like, um, she said, uh, you know, I'm really I really like working on this movie because you seem to know what you want and then you stop once you get it which, which I felt like was a kind of a given I thought okay so I, you like that I'm I'm the director <laughs> but uh, but it's really easy to show up right and you have all of this I mean luckily it wasn't my, my first rodeo so to speak but uh, to show up and you have all of this stuff and uh, and to feel like to feel rushed or to feel like uh, you know, okay, it's on. It, we got a version of it. Let's go. There's that feeling. I mean, you have to you have to prioritize. You can't just keep shooting like a little macro insert for for an hour because uh, the sun's going down. But um, I think the the thing, the lessons that I um, took into this this movie, especially that I learned on the previous ones, is to just do not ever settle for what like and just just don't settle because and if there's that little voice, it's like mm, it can be a little bit better and I. I want to get it this way, but it, but it seems like, oh, it's just a fraction off mm -hmm. in, in the shooting, and like, if, once you're willing to accept that fraction off, I mean, this movie, I've screened it a hundred times, and you know, it's been out, it, it's just been out there, right, and it's going to be up there forever, and that little fraction that you settled for um, just, just turns into a chasm, you know, really? so it's, uh, that's, that's the, the biggest thing for me, just don't, 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 uh, I think it comes to, it's a kind of, uh, you get tired, too, so you kind of want to settle, I think, or there's a little, a little lazy voice, it's like, you want to go lay down, like, <laughs> it's been 12 hours, like, hasn't that been enough, can we just, you know, I always say this down? as the director, everybody wants to go home, because it's a job for them, as a director, you never want to go home. You want to keep shooting. You want to yeah. do great stuff. And Shoot all the way, that. all the way to the end of the day, even if but you're done. Just... Isn't that why you have an AD, right? To tell you Absolutely. it is time to go home. But you have to remember that too. Every they are there to support you, and most, mm -hmm. by and large, your crew they do love working on film, but they're they're not invested the same way you are, yeah. and that's not a bad thing. You know, it's okay. So you have to continue to inspire them to want to sort of be the best version of whatever they're bringing to the table. But they do. They they get tired and they want to go home. But you can never want to go home, ever. I, the last day, the last day of filming, it was like, uh, 
it's like 15 is the longest out of course it always ends up being the longest day of filming and it was maybe three o'clock in the morning and we've gotten everything except for the other end of a telephone conversation and this insert and uh, and the crew nobody quit everybody was that they were so with me I felt like oh my god yes I got this <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I said and we were on this bridge in the middle of the night and uh, and and then I was like and I knew, I just knew I should not ask this. But I did it anyway, and I was like, can I just push my luck a little bit? I was like, okay, when we get home, um, or when we get back to base camp, can we, can we just get crap this quick little insert? Like, I, I don't, I don't want to miss it. And the and this first camera, second camera, second assistant camera was like, I, he had never gone off on me the whole time, but he just, he just laid it down. He was like, dude, I got to wake up in two hours. I got to return, check back all this equipment, back, blah, blah, like all this shit that I have not been thinking of. That he had to do. So you're absolutely right. You got to know like what the line is uh, with everybody because you want to stay up all night, but uh, you know, <laughs> not everybody does. Not everybody. Yeah. Um, I can see that we're kind of running short on time. So um, if anyone has a question specifically for Josh um, about producing, about slam dance, about uncertain terms, um, this would be a good time to ask. Or questions for any of our filmmakers. <clears throat> Otherwise, I'll ask one. Yes? For anyone, um, how do you make women? <laughs> math, tutor, LSAT, and math. <laughs> <laughs> um, I produce lots and lots of commercials, so that affords me the ability to produce the kinds of films that I want to make. I, go ahead. Yeah, I, I make commercials. I've directed 40 commercials last year, so I'm very lucky. I did this film pro bono. Every penny it makes go back goes back to the organization. So you know, I I Robin Hooded a little bit. <laughs> I'm a, a reality TV producer, so I do uh, field and line producing for reality, reality TV. I think I mentioned earlier. I, I shoot and uh, edit. Uh, you know, really being able to kind of do all of those things. I also do my own mixing you can stretch out a budget and um, you know this this piece you know that I was working for Nero Theater I did get paid you know for that from those grants and it, it financed a good part of my year so uh, but mostly work within this region doing uh, a lot of stuff for Case Western um, Cleveland Arts Prize so another question there yeah. um, this, this question gives me sort of a I mean, there's, there's a lot to draw from, like, if you're thinking small, um, but in terms of, like, if I want to, if I want to make a living, like, even just doing commercials, production, whatever, um, how important is it, like, I'm more into the writing aspect, how important is it for location, where you live, who you talk to, networking, is it so important to be out on the West Coast or the East Coast? Or is it possible now to, and I feel because of technology that maybe the film industry is becoming more fragmented, that maybe you can sort of start out in a smaller city and get your work out there via, you know, the information technology, all of that. Um, what are your guys' thought on that? I mean, as, as I've been told before, like, okay, you want to be a writer, you want to write commercials, you want to write this and that. you got to move. You can't stay in Toledo. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just say as just a writer, I think it it um, it's hard to get a lot of work if you're not on the coasts because New York and LA have have all the agencies, they have all the buyers, you know, the, the people that would hire you. As a filmmaker, I would say you can really live anywhere because a good movie is a good movie, and if you're going to make independent films and try and get them into good festivals like Sundance or Slamdance or, or you know Cleveland, and then eventually get distribution that way. It doesn't matter where you make your films. Where you might be limited is in terms of, you know, how much access you have to certain locations or to really seasoned crews. But I think that's changing. And the fact that there's, you know, film programs all throughout the country with people that are learning how to make films, like it's film school is very nuts and bolts in many ways. I mean, what you really should be getting out of film school is not learning how to make films physically, but how to work with other filmmakers so that you can continue to collaborate with them and support each other and work with other people so that you don't go onto a set and think that you're the director, uh, you're the dictator, but that you're you know, a filmmaker that's working with a group of, of people that are there to support you and to collaborate with you. 
I'm the most successful commercial director I know lives in rural New Hampshire. Lives where? In rural New Hampshire, middle of nowhere. Yeah. Um, he started in Austin. He got lucky, did a couple of cool spots, and he moved his family there years ago. And he just, yeah, it's where he lives, and he kills it. So I think it depends on what you want to do. You can manifest it. I think it really depends on your ambitions. Like, yeah. what is your goal? I, I, the, definitely the further away you get from L.A., the, the more that people are cool with you shooting places. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, like oh, yeah. we wanted to shoot at a gas station. If you call a gas station anywhere between the highways, I'll be like, take a hike, buddy. Uh, and then, but we drove out 50 miles, and, and you know, one out of ten of them will say, sure, you can do this for free, even. Uh, I, shot, I, did, I shot a movie, I produced a movie in Austin a long time ago. We got most, pretty much every day catered just from people giving us food for no reason. <laughs> uh, but if you want to, if you, I, I, I guess it really just depends on your ambition. I mean, if you want to write scripts and sell scripts, I would say you just, you have to go to LA. Or, um, unless, I, I, I don't know. Well, it just depends on what you want to write and how motivated you are to work without um, any kind of encouragement. Yeah, but so, the community I mean, does you, help, and there's a great does. film community in yeah. LA, and yeah. it really, you know, you have these great collaborators who who give you feedback, and it's it's really tremendously important creatively to have. But you can build that community anywhere. I mean, production is everywhere. I shoot all over the country, all over the world, nonstop, and there's great people everywhere. You just have to find them. Yeah, we do you have, have the, to build a community. Oh. Cleveland Film Commission here, and they have their mixers, so you can get together with a lot of local people. I, you know, when when I had a very first rough cut of Move On, I, I called Evan and a couple other my filmmaker friends from the region, John, and uh, we watched that, and they they hammered me. That's what I wanted. You know? So uh, we were we were cruel. That's true. <laughs> um, so, but again, I, I'll come back to the thing I said last time. If you're going to stay in this region. I, to be and make your living, you, you're going to probably want to. You have to diversify. You got to be able to do more than one thing. And, right. and I agree. You have to be sort of a one man band. You got to be able to write. You got to be able to do yeah. whatever. Be able to step in. Like when these films come to town, you got to be willing to take a lot of different kind of roles on those. That's what everybody here has been doing. Very true. Um, yeah. Do you think there's a threat in, in LA or in New York that there's, um, that there's too many people? Excuse me. Yeah. Thank you so much, Josh. Carry on. I, I, I want to. Do you think there's a threat in LA or in New York that there's too many people wanting to do the same thing, or do you feel that it is more supportive rather than uh, aggressive in terms of trying to, you know, get these spots and get these positions? Oh, there's a lot of work out there. I feel like everyone I know yeah. stays very busy at what they do. I, f I feel like anyone who doesn't work out there is probably relatively lazy. I mean, I think there's 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 areas that are. There's where there's a lot more. It's a lot more saturated, like you said. But I don't think that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of half-baked stuff, Pete, too. Like, I'm gonna finish my screenplay. A lot of that. But uh, I don't think if if you have like, I think you could you will uh, you could always work harder than anybody else or than most people. Like if you were or like the the w woman who asked before. Like if you there's any script you can think of is on the internet. If you, you read a script a day, write four hours a day, read two scripts a day, if you did that for a year, you would do more work than 99.9% .9 of the people that I, writers that I've ever met, including me. <laughs> I mean, it's just all about, I think if you just, you, you can always outwork somebody, I think, and no matter how saturated the thing is, but are you just willing, are you willing to do it without any kind of monet, mo, any uh, any pats on the back or any any financial reward. That's that's you know, it. I'm interested in something, Mike. You you work in LA, right? Mm. And and yet you work in this very independent mode of production. Yeah. And is it kind of is there any tension or friction between working in this very kind of independent self starting mode and being in the middle of the big industry? Do you ever feel like you're kind of 
disconnected from the industry or that the lure of the industry is somehow I mean I, I hate most of the industry like I'm, <laughs> I'm like not interested in that world like I feel like most of those people like aren't interested in cinema um, they're interested in either like fame or money or all these things that to me you know I want to be a filmmaker I want to create things I don't you know I'm okay with being broke for the rest of my life um, and when I finished my first film, like it, it played at the LA Film Festival, and they had set up this thing called Kodak Speed Dating, where you like meet with all these producers and reps and blah blah blah. And so from that, I got a bunch of contacts, and I spent like two years meeting with these people about like you know making a movie, which fucking never happened. And I was like literally going to meetings to like set up another meeting about another meeting. <laughs> and finally, I was just like, I'm not doing this shit anymore. Like this is like such a waste of time. Like I don't like these people. I don't like being around them. Like. I've wasted two years of my life, and you know that's when I just went out and like made Little Rock for fifteen thousand um, dollars, and from there I've kind of it's kind of the avenue I intend to stay in. And is there an advantage for somebody working in the uh, independent mode to have access to people with experience and things like that? What do you mean? Like in LA, that there's experienced sound recorders, experienced actors. Yeah. You know, that might not be at the same level of ta experience in other lesser secondary markets. Yeah, maybe. But I mean, at the same time, you know, it's like there's a bunch of people in L.A. that call themselves an actor that are terrible just because they have a headshot and they're, like, handsome. It doesn't mean they're a good actor. So, and I think, like, you know, there's interesting characters everywhere that you can incorporate into your movie in Idaho and Ohio or wherever. There's great crews in L.A., though. Yeah. Yes, and you can get, and they they they're very passionate about wanting to make great stuff, so they'll do it for you know yeah. very little if Absolutely. they believe in it. And that's it's a huge advantage of shooting in LA. I mean, because I'm I, ubiquitous. I mean, I shoot all over, and the crews are never as good. They're just they're not. I mean, it's you know, and we shoot in New York a ton, and I love New Yorkers, but it's a pain in the ass. You know, I mean, it's like LA is built to shoot. It never rains. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, it, the crews are just extraordinary, and you know in. It's like anything, you can find some jaded ones, or, but, but by and large, if you, you know, I mean, my crew is my family, and, you know, they'll follow me to the end of the earth, and, I'm, and I love them for it. Yeah, I think you have to know what you're made of, and you're gonna find out what you're made of either way it goes. I'm, I was from Mississippi, I moved, I drove my car from a little Clinton, Mississippi, to Los Angeles. I stayed in a shithole, I worked at the Olive Garden, you know, um, you're gonna find out what you're made of and if you're willing or not to do, you know, made to do this. And at the same time, you're gonna find out the people around you if they're made to do this. Because otherwise, they're gonna go home, they're gonna quit, they're gonna cry, and so are you. But are you, you know, <laughs> but can you, can you persevere? And will you persevere? You know, um, I don't like shooting in LA, so I absolutely agree with that. Because everybody, you know, Everyone's in the industry, or you know, they work at NBC, or I used to make the Muppet Bug Babies, or you know, everyone has something. They just want to talk to you and get in your way and say no or ask for a lot of money. But as soon as you, you know, put some gas in your tank and go as far as like Barstow or somewhere, they're like, yeah, come on, let's. You can shoot at my house or whatever. So I, I agree with that, but then also agree with what you're saying. Like, they're professionals. There's people that are there, and what I find is if you if you can meet someone that's making a living you're not a threat to them because you're asking them to do something where you're not going to pay them. It's more of a threat when someone's broke and they're trying to get rich off of you. You know, so mm -hmm. if you, you know, if a sound guy's used to making, you know, 800 a day or 600 a day and you're like, hey, I, you know, I can give you $75 and great pizza. If he's, <laughs> if he's working a lot, if he likes your project, he's going to do it. You know, and then you're getting an $800 a day sound guy. It's harder to find that, I think, in you know Utah or New Jersey or whatever because those guys are looking for work and you you present yourself as an opportunity and they're opportunists mm -hmm. you yeah. know I mean I'd say absolutely it was a it was a advantage to shoot um, Young Kislowski in Los Angeles um, I was a PA on a movie in Austin and the director of that movie was Danny Liner and Danny Liner has done a, um, a lot of television shows and he directed uh, Harold and Kumar and uh, dude, where's my car? And I just kept up with this guy after, um, for like six, seven years. And he's one of the producers on The Young Kislowski. And, the, and it was through him uh, that we were able to get these kind of post deals uh, through people that he knew who came on and invested in the movie um, that we were able to do 
not Skywalker, man, that sounds awesome. <laughs> but, uh, you know, go to like a proper place and like a you know, big mixing board and the guys who knew what they were doing and make it sound, uh, and make it sound really good. And the actors too, I mean, there are so many actors out there and, and many of them, um, you know, might not be right for your project. But, uh, but there's also like, uh, if an actor, it's the same thing, like if, a, you know, if they like your script, the first person that we attached got to be in the movie was this guy Josh Molina, and he's making a shit ton of money on television. Like he doesn't need to do this. The only, the only reason that he would do it is if uh, he likes the script because he's going to make like three hundred dollars being in this movie <laughs> for for four days when he could just be sitting at home with his family, you know. So uh, nine out of ten actors do, who are of that level don't want to do it, or they've got something else to do, or they whatever. But you know, there's there are so there's so many actors that you would think that like oh, you know he's on some famous show like I'll never, like uh, what does he want to do with me? But that guy is looking for somebody with like a great script and who thinks that like you're my guy, you know, and I want you to be. I mean that guy would love to be in a movie that plays at South by or Cleveland or Sundance or wherever or Slam Dance where he's gone. <laughs> but those they really do and and there's uh, you know getting your stuff to that guy that that might take a little bit of legwork but uh, and but they're there but they're there and they re they want to do it if the script is good they actually to just it. follow up on this before we get take another question Ted you're the one who shot a lot in Cleveland and uh, Hero Tomorrow your previous feature had a lot of locations, and can you talk a little bit about the challenges and also the kind of benefits of shooting in Cleveland? Because I think a lot of people here, that's probably close to home. Yeah, well, I think we had uh, like 43 locations. Um, and That's how not to make an independent film, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was written by my friend Milo Miller and I, and we spent three years writing this script knowing that someday we were going to make a movie. We didn't really have any kind of, you know, date in mind, a, a deadline. And then when we had our script where we wanted it, um, that was the same year I was getting married, and there was no way I was going to try to shoot a movie and plan a wedding and all that stuff in the same year. So I just started storyboarding, and I, you know, had never shot anything narrative before, and really did, I thought, three panels a day. You know, by the end of the year, I'll have maybe 900 images. But I, I ended up with 1,500 images. It's this big stack of, of images. And for having no experience, any time an actor came through that I was trying to impress, I said, here's our movie. Bam. <laughs> and it really worked out. You know, people believed in the project because of all the prep. And on set, I was able to work with my brother, who had no film experience, and three other friends who had no film experience whatsoever. We, I mean... This was our crew, and I probably had three days of set experience in my life. And, uh, you know, I, I always say I learned filmmaking when I made those 1,500 images. You know, that was, from before that I was like a composer, audio guy, but that's, you know, you force yourself in every scene to draw all those angles and figure all that out, and it just, uh, it really carried over. Now, getting into the, the Cleveland locations, everybody was, very willing to help us out, you know. We didn't have a big, we didn't have a budget barely at all. So uh, any store we talked to, again, I could just drop that big thing of storyboard there, and they're like, "Oh, this looks like it's going to happen." All right, yeah. So, um, you know, that's the thing we can do as indies. Um, you know, when you talk about out hustling somebody or whatever, you time. know, like the time. You know, that's, what that's, are you willing to do? That's what you have. That's what friend. I have. You know. Yeah, you got to. That's that's the advantage that I have. Some working writers doesn't have the time, but it's making a lot of money. So, <laughs> Jordan, you had a question. Just kind of sound outside of the big productions, is there much of a role for ADR and Foley in your work? Def yeah, definitely. We did. A, I mean, for 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 me, we did, would. Uh, the, the, I mean, it it, it was just um, a, again a function of the fact that. We were we were able to to get into this a, a nice post house and and um, mix the movie really nice and go you know get an ADR list of what needs to be replaced and uh, and sweeten all these nice sounds. I mean it's it's a uh, key. I mean it's, it's back key. to the sound. It's cruel and unusual to actors, but it is key. Yeah. I mean they just hate it, but you have to do it. Oh, some well, one of my actors was like, 
Like, I'm the ADR queen. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice, nice. She's like, I will, I will match exactly the mouth, exactly the line. You know, it's a, it's a very tough thing to ask an actor to do. It's like to get back to that place, you know, emotionally. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a brutal thing to ask of them, but it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. Mike, how do you handle it? Do you do ADR? Because um, when you're dealing with impro improvised dialogue, it must be a little bit more difficult. Well, after the sound fiasco on my first film, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. I had like ADR entire scenes, which was like the biggest nightmare learning experience of my life. Um, so, I mean, basically when I go into a movie, I say, like, I don't want to do any ADR. So, like, that's why I'm listening to the takes back and over and over, doing wild lines on set. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, of course, you have to do some, you know, but I try to keep it as, as minimal as possible. Because um, I think it, it is weird, like, some actors can come in and kill it. And are amazing. Like, I have this little girl that's in Lake Los Angeles who had a bunch of stuff to ADR. And, I mean, it was, like, verbatim, tonally, performance-wise. And then, like a professional actor who's been acting for years, come in and just like can't get the fucking simplest line. Yeah, I think it comes down to just how good of a um, if, if they're good at doing impressions, because you you really are like kind of doing an impression of yourself. Like, can you do a spot on impression of yourself? And you don't necessarily have to get. So a lot of actors come in like they want to get back to that place, and uh, which is like so hard to do. Like talking into a microphone, but um, and then some of them will just listen to the voice and get in the rhythm and then just say it exactly that way. So I think that's really what, like, can they do an impression of themselves? <laughs> Seth, did you? Um, I, I didn't need to do any ADR for mine. I mean, we did, we did some voiceover and expedition down the block, um, but we didn't, we didn't do any. I would try to stay away from it just because, probably for the same reason, I want someone to be the character while we're shooting and to ask them to become that character again three months later. It also makes my art feel hokey. Like, it makes me feel like they're there, like, okay, now I'm the tough guy again doing that scene. And it's just like, oh, this is what my movie's made out of. So I try to stay away from stuff like that. But, uh, I mean, luckily we live in a world where it's possible, so it's needed. Yeah. I will bust a take if I hear an airplane go by. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Yeah. I, like, hear everything now. I'll just rewrite script, like, airplane flying. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question back there, and then I'll take it. No, that's you. Bill John. Uh, Bill John, Cinema Productions. Uh, my first feature, uh, talk about nightmares with sound guys. Uh, I had a sound guy who could literally fall asleep holding the boom. Mm. Oh, and keep it up. I, yeah. Uh, until he started snoring. And then he could hear that. And so, yeah, so that's a bad take. But he actually would let the, one time the microphone, it had a, a battery pack on it. It's an old Sennheiser, 24 inch, you know. And it's, the battery started to die, so this hiss started growing with every shot, and he never said anything. And I ended up ADR in 95% of the movie. Oh, uh, and uh, I found that there's a, there's a real trick to doing some ADR, is now that we have electronic, you know, and while you, know, you have your editing, you can do right on the timeline and stuff like that, it made it a lot easier to just, here's the sentence. da 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 Just get that one sentence. And then they would say it almost exactly the same in the booth. They didn't have to wait for the count. They didn't have to wait for the timing. They would just try and repeat pretty much what they said, a sentence at a time. And days later, weeks later, we had a complete retrack of the whole thing. Yes. Which, Foley-wise, and then of course we had to Foley the whole movie. And uh, Foley-wise, though, it actually ended up working out much better because if you get distribution, which we did, you have the international ME track that you have to come up with, which is just music and effects. So you have to drop all the voices anyway. So we didn't have any problem with that, but of course, making an ME track is another nightmare. But, but yeah, audio is, it, everybody thinks about it the last thing, but we were supposed to be in a big house too. It was supposed to be, the power supposed to be out. And every time the furnace came up, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, one other little trick that we learned later than I wish I would have um, for on Hero Tomorrow. Um, once you roll your whole scene and you're about to break down and move on, I would take the actors and take the audio guy and say, just go ahead and run through the lines a couple times just for audio. And um, sometimes you'll get some very usable stuff where you might have run into a problem. And um, 
also just grabbing the audio from an alternate take and popping it onto the video of a take that you um, you think has bad sound sometimes it can be just enough in sync that no one will ever know and it, it does still feel the same you know or if you like the, the way they're moving the bodies but you like the way they said it you know, there was so yeah. much of that yeah. in, in this movie so much of that movie question there this question's for Seth how do you make a Kickstarter campaign successful like what did you do to make people support your film um, gosh, what did I do? Um, I was a lot of faking, like I knew what I was doing. You know? <laughs> and I'm serious, like, I mean, I looked at other people's Kickstarters that worked and I was super intimidated. And I was like, you don't even look like you need the money. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you look like you already made the movie. And it was just, I was really intimidated. But um, I just thought about it, I just sat down, I was like, okay, I'm educated, I can do this. And um, first of all, I don't know if anyone has seen Duda's Revenge, but Duda's Revenge is about a neglected child who misses his school field trip. And um, I definitely wanted to um, not just want, not just motivate people to give me money because they like me or we're friends on Facebook, but because um, they cared about the subject. So I got teachers involved. Um, we did a little bit of community outreach just as far as schools and teachers and people like that. And um, just try to make it look as professional as possible. I did the video, you know, we shot a little video in my living room and everything like that, but um, just outsourcing, and it's, it sucks because I'm one of those people that, I just want to do the art. I don't want to advertise. I don't want to ask for money. I don't want to convince you to like my stuff, but um, you just have to put on that hat and just say, okay, we're gonna do this and go hard. But this is one thing I did do. I, um, I made it very short. So it was, I think my Kickstarter campaign was only like two weeks, and I kept the goal very low. So my goal was only like, like 2,500, because I knew I was like, hey, if I, you know, if I get 12,000, I can get all of that. But I was scared of saying my goal is 12,000 and getting 6,000, and then not getting any of it. So you need to be realistic with yourself and realistic with the people that you're asking to help out with, you know. And um, I also had, I also made sure that I didn't put myself in a position where if I don't succeed with the Kickstarter, I can still make the movie. You know, so just prepare for failure and then don't fail. To echo his sentiment about Kickstarter, I, I, I hate it. Oh, yeah, I don't want to do it again. It's, it's the worst. And I did it. We did it on a film. We did it on this film. Uh, we did it, and it was a fifty thousand dollar Kickstarter. We ended up with like seventy two. It was lovely. Yeah. But a, a, a sort of a real goal of Kickstarter is to like find your sort of core audience for the film, and it's a good way to actually engage your yeah. core audience early. Um, and then these people become part of the social movement of the film as well. So it has its positives and minuses. I hate sort of hat in handing, asking people I know for money uh, who don't really have it, and they feel obligated to give it, and it just makes me crazy. And then I did it again for my next film. <laughs> uh, and I promised myself I was never going to do it again. I and felt exactly the same. With the Allison. Same sort of like, uh, should I be doing this? We didn't. We didn't have to do it for Kieślowski. Um but I'm making another movie this summer, and same same goal, 50 grand. Yeah. And uh, I'm passing out cards here. Right? <laughs> and uh, and the we shot a video. I, I would say the thing is like make them fall in love with your project, but also I would really say make a, it's you. Like if if they like you, yeah. If they like the way your like your earnestness and like what you how passionate you are about what you're doing. And uh, we shot a video before with a not so great camera and the DP of, the guy's gonna be the DP of my movie was like, we have to do this again. And I'm like, well, I'm leaving. I can't do this right now. I'm like, well, we'll do it tomorrow morning. And, uh, and so we just went, came back, did the same video the next morning with a different camera. And uh, because people will um, e equate the quality of your Kickstarter video with the quality of what you finished product. Will be the and they won't read good. any, by the way, won't read anything. So if you want, Whatever you want to get across, two and a half minutes, your name, <laughs> what you're doing, why you're doing it, why it's so important to you. And if you could just get people to like you a little bit. And yeah, use so. a good microphone, it has to sound good. Sound <laughs> good. Not sound like an iPhone in an empty room. <laughs> <laughs> and sweet little bit, there's this site called Free Sounds Org, something like yeah. that. And, uh, and I had picked some pictures that I'd taken about the movie. Um, I feel like I'm just about to launch into my campaign now. Right? Uh, but I, I'd taken some pictures and, uh, and I said, okay, well, here's the next story, blah, blah, blah. 
And then I cut away to those pictures and just did the like, you know, the little Ken Burns effect thing. And, uh, and put, there was a picture of a girl at school, right? I just went to a school, started taking pictures. I, they were fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, told what the story was and just put a little bit of movement and then just found, went online and got like kids at school, you know, at the canteen. And put that sound underneath it and it feels like a hundred times, it yeah. feels like, oh, this is, this is, like you said, though, this is really happening. This person is actually serious about this. Because everybody wants to back, the other lesson I learned too is that they all want to back a winner. They want to back someone like, oh, I want to back this person because like they will get, they will get to 2,500. You know, yeah. he, he is going to be the next blah, blah, blah. Yeah. They want to get in on that. When you put all this energy in and you, and you make a great video and you do a good, and you have to have a plan, like your updates and your prizes and all that stuff. But something fascinating does happen. We were over our goal on the Kickstarter campaign on this, and then it went viral. And I didn't recognize 570 names of people who donated on the last day. I didn't know one of them. So it does work, and it does make you crazy, and it's awful, and it's the worst 30 days ever. Yeah. <laughs> but it does have tremendous sort of value, and it's free money, let's be honest. It's like, <laughs> you know, you need money to make stuff, and it's like, you know. Also, if you just sort of post it and go away, like, it will go nowhere. Like, yes. You really got to fight like for it. Sell it. It's a full-time job. Just think about who would want to watch this movie, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, like, go to a school, go to, go to a, you know, Go here. Tell everybody about it here when they're leaving. Like that. That sort of. Once the site is up, like, yeah. like find ten different places, twenty different places that. Could yeah, we had disability live. rights advocates blogging yeah. about our Kickstarter. I mean, it just it blogs, worked. Everything. You know. I think we have time for one more question. There was a woman in red in the back. There. Can you just talk a little bit about post-production marketing and distribution and how that works? A simple question. <laughs> that's that's hard. Well, that's the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, post is brutal. We I cut this film for 22 months wow. oh, with two full-time editors um, and two brilliant editors, and we just there are 60 iterations of this film, and wow. I couldn't find the story, and I felt this incredible burden. Um, to tell it in a way that I experienced it, because I'd never seen anything like this before. I'd never seen this progressive approach towards disability, and it wasn't right. And I refused to stop until it was, and it was an incredibly arduous process. Um, and we had the same editor who just cut uh, Hunting Season, the, the Sundance doc, and uh, Invisible War, and he was relentless with me. He never gave up, and it was, I mean, he's my just, you know, heterosexual life partner <laughs> and, uh, and it's important to find somebody who feels that way with you who, especially when you're making docs because editing is everything you know and I, I killed ourselves to make it look beautiful and sound beautiful but we cut this film forever uh, and on the distribution side man who knows it's just a roll of the dice it's sort of like you know I was very lucky with my first couple of films HBO bought our first film Sundance and IFC bought our second film and this film's a very very tough sell it's a it's a very sweet, funny look at filmmaking through the eyes of people with disability. It's just, it's not, it's not a blockbuster, but it's, you know, it's the film I want to make right now, and it's the story I want to tell, and, I, you know, who knows? You know, find a good sales rep. You know, that's it, because it's like, it's not my job to sell the film, it's my job to make the best possible film, and someone else is to sell it, and so I don't know, I don't know, it's a tough one. Mike, how, how do you feel about that? I mean, you've made quite a number of films at this point, and they seem to be getting around. Um, well, I mean, Little Rock, you know, was on the festival circuit for two years before we ever got an offer for anything. And I was ready to, like, go rapper style and, like, sell DVDs out the back of my trunk. <laughs> um, and, you know, I don't know what changed, you know, why the distributor contacted me at that point, but. Um, and I've done other films where like nothing, you know, I'm sending it out to everyone and just totally rejected for distribution. So, I mean, I think now it's a kind of time where you can figure out distributing uh, distributing a film yourself without having having to worry about that stuff so much. But yeah, I don't know. It's a scary kind of thing that you're always entering because, um, especially when you're making stuff, I think on a small budget and stuff that you're passionate about, it might not always equal like making a lot of money. And that's just part of the, the trade-off. I think I think editing is is really where you figure out how to tell the story, and um, I think it's imperative to know some aspect of editing. You know, you don't have to know how to click on every single little thing and know how to do everything, 
but I think you need to know your acts and how to move the story along. And if you just, I didn't trust just giving it to a guy and saying, these are the points, talk to you in a month. So um, I sat in my kitchen, I did it myself. I edited my, my film in about three weeks and then I contacted a post-production company and um, I basically just asked a guy if he would kind of like go through it and just fine tune it and um, just shave some fat off some of the scenes. Um, which worked because it also saved me some money. But I, I don't understand why in today's time, you know, if you can't find Adobe Premiere or Final Cut or something, and just get the ball rolling and get going. And if you don't have a lot of money, I think it's encouraging to an editor to say, hey, I at least started and this is what I'm trying to do. I built an outline, a skeleton or something. Um, yeah, and as far as distribution. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, yeah. you can get Avid, you can get student edition of Avid for. $300 or something. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and if you're making a short, I mean, there's no reason. And you can watch, just take two or three days and watch videos yeah. online to, to, learn, to learn basic editing, even color correction. Yeah. Like, the, color correction sounds like this, like, oh, this is a grid. Like, I can't imagine how to do color. It's, it's, there's like basic stuff that you can do that, uh, I mean, unless you're going to spend 25 grand, and like, if you, unless you've got a big feature film, you're going to spend 20, 50 grand. Okay, if you're just doing a short, like, um, I, you could, you, I swear, I learned this like last week how to do color correction on Avid. It took me 45 minutes to watch these videos, and like the basic stuff is explained. Premiere's, and, uh, Premiere's 20 bucks a month. It's important to be to have some level of being able to be didactic when it comes to filmmaking. You have to get in there, you know. And yeah, I don't know why you wouldn't want to try. And even if it sucks, you can still have someone else edit it. You know, <laughs> get involved and show that you care about your film a little bit. Okay, I uh, think that we are a little bit over time, in fact, here. And uh, just want to say thank you so much to all our filmmakers. Uh, look for their films, look for their next films, support their work. And thank you guys so much for being here. I really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Yeah.